We're live. Hello. We, we are live, calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson. Back in your it. studio. I, it, my, my studio, yes. And yeah. calling Rick Beyer in, I don't know where you are. Unless Longmont, have, Colorado. Do they have Novotels in Longmont, Colorado? This is, a, this is a Hilton Garden Inn hotel. It looks oddly like a Novotel. But yeah, it has that know. kind of feeling, too. But we just got in today. We're visiting uh, our son, Andy, out here. And so we'll be here all week. And Marilyn's just off camera there someplace uh welcome everybody to history happy hour brought to you with the help and assistance of Stephen ambrose historical tours who offer a variety of history tours in europe the u.s and the pacific some of them even led by people who host this show oddly enough check it out at Stephen ambrose tours.com and whether you're watching live watching on replay or listening on our podcast thank you for joining us and today we will be talking about josephine baker and her world war ii espionage um yeah so chris uh uh we should mention our uh patreon top shelf people yes, and should. thank them yes i want you to see that there's that Whoa, hey. we're, we're extending now into the next column and right. uh and i hope jim stark sees that that i responded to his email we did get him up there uh and these are all of our top shelf patrons but we have many other patrons as well we appreciate all of you and everybody can and should may i add uh become a patron at <laughs> patreon.com slash history happy hour i you know and should and, and if i had ads from our sponsor i would read ads from our sponsor you know i mean i'm ready to do whatever it takes chris yeah. do, do, we, do we have enough hats for all this? history happy hour staff announcer rick buyer yeah <laughs> I, it's, a, it's good to have a role. Is anybody yeah. watching out there, Chris? There are quite a few people, in fact. Uh, Lizzie Borden from London, uh, Thomas Benner uh, from West Virginia, Frank Cook, uh, Lynn Hargrove, Doreen's back. She's not on stage, so that's good. Uh, Jim Stark, yeah. Doug McCord, and, your friend Doug. Well, it's so good to be back live again after several weeks of being yeah. whatever not live is. It's not dead, but it's it's not sleeping, <laughs> but it's not live. So it's good to be yeah. here causing trouble in the flesh so i think we have probably wasted enough of our guests right, time so. at this point don't you think so, so? yeah, yeah. Right. so right. why don't you give me a cue to get started here You brought the bell, or is that a is that a phone bell? Oh, yeah. See, it didn't ring quite the same one. The bar is open. The bar is open. <laughs> <laughs> What's on tap, Chris? Yeah. Well, this week uh, we've been getting a lot of um, interest in this show. Once the, once the bell is off, the, the bell keeps ringing. The it's, bell's it's, so excited it's, about it's this week's hard, week's hard show. to control. Yes. Yeah. Well, this week we have. Uh, uh, author Damien Lewis on to join us to talk about his new book about Josephine Baker. And for those of you who don't know, you should. Uh, Damien Lewis is an award-winning writer who spent more than 20 years writing about all kinds of nasty conflicts for the BBC and other people. Uh, and when he, he's not busy with that, he's a best-selling author of a lot of books, as we would say in Boston, more than 20, in fact, uh, with a special emphasis on uh, military history. Uh, and he looks quite a bit. He's most well known over here, I think, for his series of books on the Special Air Service uh, and War Dogs. But uh, this week, we're going to talk about his new book, which I'm really excited about, Agent Josephine, American Beauty, French Hero, and British Spy. Damien Lewis, welcome. Great to be with you guys. I, I, I should, should ask everybody if you have a cocktail with you today. It is happy hour, of course. It is happy hour. What have you got, Chris? Oh, I, I've got a Bailey's because it's cold, wet, gray, and miserable here. Okay. And Damien, what did you bring to the table? That uh, is a Brandy Alexander. Oh, oh my much, goodness. That is much more yes. And I'm uh, I'm here I'm here in the good old U.S. of A. drinking a beer out of a plastic <laughs> cup. Oh, right. So after you insulted my dress sense, you're bringing a beer out of a plastic cup. I okay. insulted your dress sense off the air. Now, oh, but thanks right. for bringing that up. <laughs> so anyway, so should we talk about some history? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> please, Chris, please. So, um, David, uh, just to start, Ernest Hemingway uh, said that she was, and she obviously is Josephine Baker, the most sensational woman anybody ever saw or ever will. And I think that probably in the years, uh, the decades since her death, maybe that's 
She's not as well known as she once was. Could you just to kind of give us a baseline, tell us a little bit about who she was and how big a sensation she was before? Sure. Yeah. So Josephine um, obviously was, you know, born in St. Louis uh, in the States and um, brought up in poverty um, and pretty much ran away from from home and from St. Louis in her teens, in her early teens. And how that came about was that she, um, a traveling kind of salesman came to St. Louis and the way he brought people to, he was a quack really, he sold medicines, um, you know, dodgy medicines. And the way he got people to his store was he had a competition. The competition was this, you won a dollar if you were the best dancer. And as soon as he announced the competition, Josephine jumped up on stage and danced and danced and she won the competition, ran home to her mother with that $1 bill. And uh, she suddenly realized in that moment, maybe there's a way that I could actually get out of poverty and earn a living uh, by dancing, um, you know, using this talent, this natural talent that I have. And trying to cut a long story short, she realized that, you know, she would have to make her way to Broadway in New York. And that's the place you make it as somebody on the stage. And so she did that. It was was very difficult. There were lots of challenges on the way. But eventually she kind of broke through and she starred in a in, in, in a show called Shuffle Along and various others. But by the age of 19, she was cognizant very aware of the fact that in in jim crow jane crow america where segregation was was still all the rage of course um she she was never going to make it as the star she believed or she hoped she might be and so at that moment 19 years of age an impresario an american impresario who, who lived and worked in paris approached her because she was putting on a, a starting a new show called the la revue negra um a new musical in Paris and she wanted Josephine, she invited Josephine to be the lead female role and uh, Josephine had heard that Europe was relatively free of segregation of the kind of prejudice she had experienced in the States and she decided to go, I mean it, it was a difficult decision, she took a heart in her hands, sailed on a liner from, from New York to Paris, you know daunting for a, a young girl had never been out of at the States, um, but she did just that. And when she arrived in France and, you know, she started to show, to star in the show in Paris, she realized very quickly that this maybe was a country where she could be everything she wanted to be. Um, it was a, it was a liberation for her and a revolution. And that show, um, it, you know, there were two reactions to that show really. One was people were absolutely bowled over and amazed and in rapture. And the other was people were scandalized and outraged because there was lots of nudity and it, it played very much the, the kind of noble savage um, kind of um, uh, stereotype, um, which was all the rage in Europe at the time, it has to be said. But, but very quickly, it catapulted Josephine into the limelight and in stardom, into superstardom. You know, this tour toured Europe. She went to you know, all the major capitals, including, of course, Berlin, where it was an absolute sellout, it was a sellout all, all, all over Europe. And by her early 20s, you know, Josephine had become one of the most, certainly one of the most photographed, if not the most photographed women in the world. And she was you know, rubbing shoulders with the likes of Hemingway, you mentioned Picasso, all the top arts and social scene in France. Um, you know, and she was a very, very wealthy woman. She went from success to success to success and as time went on she kind of graduated i guess from the kind of risque almost naked um sexually charged routines much more to these kind of um you know she was doing opera um you know immediately prior to the war she was singing in i forgot the name the opera i'm sorry um uh so she she kind of not only just found herself and, and the equality that she'd sought for it's for so long in France and, and Europe, uh, European cities across Europe. But she also found not only fame and fortune, but she found her mojo as a serious performer and was acclaimed by critics as being, you know, having this fantastic singing voice and this f fantastic ability to dance. And not only that, of course, she also became a movie star. She served, she starred in three movies before the war and she was the first black female role in a major movie ever. So she broke all these glass ceilings at the same time. That's kind of Josephine in a nutshell um, in the run up to, you know, her life in the run up to the war.
So I'm 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 I have I have not now nor have I ever served in any espionage service. Uh, but uh, if I was recruiting a spy, uh, I probably wouldn't go with the best known person uh, yeah. and the best known face in Europe or maybe the world at that time. I just would probably go somewhere else on the spectrum. So I'm wondering, um, how does it happen that she gets uh, recruited as a, uh, a sort of a, an amateur spy? The phrase uh, used was honorable correspondent. How, how does that happen and why her? Yeah, it's a brilliant question. Um, that's exactly what I thought when I first, about probably 11, 12 years ago now, heard that Josephine Baker had been a spy in World War II, which is a snippet of reportage somewhere. And I thought, well, that's impossible, just like you. You know, the most famous, one of the most famous women in the world before the war, so instantly recognizable, such a signature, um, you know, brand almost. It uh, sounds like 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 hype or something. You know. Yeah, it just it, that's not possible. You, how can you be a grey person hiding in the shadows? How can you be a cloak and dagger warrior if you are the most instantly recognisable one of the world's greatest superstars? It's just crazy. You have that, to ask what, Chris because he, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's yeah. dealt with all that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's what piqued my interest. I was like, well, this is this doesn't make sense and there was resistance a lot of resistance to the initial suggestion that josephine be recruited as a spy i mean it came about because you know we've got to bear in mind that the first world war and all those millions of deaths wasn't that long ago it still fresh in people's minds there were still war wounded you know on the streets and so britain and france in particular were just unwilling to countenance the fact that there might be another war with the old enemy in Europe. You know, it just was something that we did not want to think about or believe or prepare for. And to that extent, you know, the intelligence services in France and Britain as well were woefully underfunded and woefully understaffed in the run up to the war. And so in their attempts to warn allied leaders, French and British leaders in particular, that um, that war was coming, that Nazi Germany was going to go to war, and Hitler knew exactly what he was doing. All their warnings were falling upon deaf ears. And at the same time, they were getting inundated with German spies, spies from the Abwehr, the German Foreign Intelligence Service, you know, France and Britain as well, were just getting swamped. And so these underfunded intelligence services, and the British and French intelligence service were working very, very closely prior to the war, especially in Paris. Commander Dunderdale, we'll probably mention him later, and Paul Pellol, you know, thick as thieves, trying to work out how they could counter this threat. And so they came up with this idea, well, we've got no budget to hire agents, um, not no political support. So they fell back upon a, a tried and tested means of asking for volunteers, as simple as that. And th in France, they called them honorary correspondents. And basically, an honorary correspondence is a freelance, voluntary spy who, because of the nature of their family or their work or their upbringing or their profession, Ha walks in those kind of um, circles and fields where it's it's conducive to be a good spy. So, for example, of course, journalists and authors make good spies because we're always travelling, uh, asking difficult questions, taking notes is a great cover for being a spy. But so too, actually, as it happens, do um, performers because similar set of reasons. They travel all over the world. They've got every reason to go wherever a show is being held and they mix with those high society circles. So there was this kind of tradition that that performers could make good honorary correspondents and, and indeed spies. But when Josephine was suggested, and the suggestion was made in the um, at the Dizien Bureau, which was the French counterintelligence service, those people who were charged to hunt down all the German spies across France, um, among other things. And the suggestion was made by Colonel Paul Pellol, who was the head of the the German desk at the Dizien Bureau, and it did not meet with universal enthusiasm, and, and, and for several reasons. One, there was the the history of Matahari, which you all know of, the First World War spy, who was a, likewise a dancer, who of course turned out to be a double agent. So there was that shadow hanging over them. But also, you know, people questioned whether someone like Josephine would be one of those, and I paraphrase, one of those, you know, high flying stars who would shatter like glass. At the first sign of danger so they wondered if she had the steely resolve to be a spy um, and it was only because Pelol, Colonel Pelol, insisted 
that Jacques Abte, Captain Jacques Abte, who was one of his deputies, long-standing Desian Bureau agent, was obliged to go and try to recruit Josephine. And he did so with very low expectations. In fact, he almost had to be forced to drive out to her chateau where she lived on the outskirts of Paris in Le Vecinet to, to make the approach. And he expected to come back empty-handed. He expected to meet the archetype of Josephine. And that's, a, you know, you can imagine her, you know, wonderful ball gown, dripping in jewellery, you know, very much the high society, high flying, you know, um, a figure that that, 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 that that had been manufactured to front up her brand. And that really wasn't something he thought that they could, they could um, adopt to the ends of, 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 of the Dissian Bureau and being an honorary correspondent. No, so David, I think it's also important maybe to talk about what French France means to Josephine and, and how she views her position in France. Because again, early twenties, international sensation, entertainer. She could have said, "Hey, I'll entertain the troops," and then you know, when the war starts, catch a boat to somewhere else. But that's not what she does. And you have a really moving uh, quote. She says uh, when she's approached by Abte, uh, it says. You know, and asked her to get involved in this. She says, France has made me all that I am. I shall be eternally grateful to her. I gave my heart to Paris as Paris gave me hers. Captain, I am ready to give my country my life. Dispose of me as you will. I mean, this was a very serious commitment on her part. Yeah, sure. And you're absolutely right, of course. You know, Josephine, you know, she'd actually given up her American citizenship because she married a Jewish guy called Jean Lyon just before the war, Jewish industrialist. Um, they'd fallen in love. In fact, he taught her to fly. So she was a pilot, you know, amongst many other things. She flew her own light <laughs> aircraft. I mean, in her spare time. You know, yeah. In her spare time. And, she, she, and that became part of her spying um, work as well. But but despite the fact she'd given up her, her American citizenship, which you had to at that time to become French, um, you know, she she could have gone to the American embassy and got her papers and gone back to the States. Yeah. No problem at all. When it became clear that, you know, Nazi Germany was on the march, and, and along with all those other Americans who did, it wasn't their fight. They were... You know, they were neutral in the war. She was this global superstar. Why not? Well, the why not um, is, is a really important um, question to answer. It's, it's a standout quality of Josephine. Um, so to in illustrate it, really, just jump back two or three years. I said she performed in the Le Revue Negre in Berlin and toured Germany. And she had this, you know, standout sellout success. Well, she returned 1937, um, 36, 37 on a tour which was scheduled to last for six months. She lasted three weeks. And she lasted three weeks because she came face to face with the horrors of the rise of Nazism herself on the stage in terms of the heckling, in terms of leaving the theatres getting attacked, in terms of the horrendous vitriolic abuse in the press, and also the official attacks made upon her by the, by, by the German authorities, by the, Nazi, the, the authorities of Nazi Germany. And so within three weeks she'd seen the ugly, horrific, um, xenophobic, you name it, face of Nazism. And she realized what was coming. She realized herself at first time what was coming. And, you know, she, she, she came back from that. And then shortly thereafter, of course, there was um, the, the International Exposition in Paris and, uh, and Goebbels, the, the, the Nazi Germany's propaganda minister, um, published a pamphlet of all the things that would degenerate that Nazi Germany stood against and Josephine was on the cover. So Nazi right. Germany itself had made her, you know, an enemy of the state. And bear in mind what Josephine had found in France and Europe. In France and Europe, she'd found the freedom to be who she could be. And she'd taken that to heart. You know, she'd been given wings and she could fly. And suddenly, and this is the point, she saw in the rise of Nazi Germany, the rise of this horrendous credo, which could take all of that away from her again. And the point was, you know, Nazi Germany was about a global Reich. You know that it was a, it, 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 they weren't going to stop at the borders of Europe. This was, right. this was a world project. And so if the world fell under the shadow of Nazism, where could Josephine Baker and those like her flee to where they could be safe from those predations while well, there was nowhere. So you could argue, she had no option but to stand and fight. And that's what she argued herself. Yeah. So um, the book goes into a lot of detail about everything she did over a period of time from 1938 in terms of espionage to something early 1944, as well as kind of a little bit uh, beyond that. Um, 
But maybe you could give us an idea, uh, a, a little bit of an, a sense of what kind of espionage she is uh, carrying out. You can give us an example or, or a couple of examples. You know, what is she doing and, and how is she doing it? Because she's, uh, she's pretty inventive and pretty, um, pretty amazing in the way that she is uh, uh, transmitting or carrying information. But give us a little bit of sense, a sense of Josephine Baker, the spy. Yeah, so the first um, ever mission she was given, so Jacques Abte goes to recruit her, and he is um, he's gobsmacked. He's bowled over. Because he turns up at, at the chateau, and she, she, far from being, you know, glittering ball ground and jewels, she's dressed in a gardening clothes, old guard, gardening clothes, gathering snails to feed her ducks. She was a lifelong lover of animals. And so very quickly, they're sat together in, in her chateau, and he's treated to something which you know, people who worked with Josephine and knew her, you know, termed the Josephine effect, which was this absolutely magnetic, unique ability that she had to reach out from people on the stage. So if you were in the audience, you know, she had this way of making you believe she was there singing, especially individually for you personally, and dancing for you personally. It was quite exceptional. And one of her dancers who's still alive, a guy called Jean-Pierre Reggiori, lives in New York, French guy, um, who's been, who was hugely helpful in my research. He was the first person who described this to me. And he said it was just so powerful. Jacques Abte is treated to that and he thinks, well, if we can harness Joseph, the Jonas Josephine effect, which she uses so well on the stage to the world of espionage, there is nothing, arguably, that she, which this person is not going to be capable of in terms of espionage. And so he sets her a challenge and he says, look, your first mission, we, the, the Allies are desperate to know what the intentions of, of the Italians will be, the Italian government, Mussolini will be, should Nazi Germany uh, declare war? Because at that time, we didn't know, some months before the outbreak of war, the de declaration of war by Germany. Um, and so the reason Abte gives her that, that assignment in particular is because uh, she wasn't always the best judge of character. And before the war, she had become enamored by Mussolini. She'd been on tour to, to, to Italy and fallen for his kind of strong man um, persona and she'd realized afterwards of course that, that how mistaken she had been but as far as the Italians were concerned you know she was still flavor of the month and that gave her a fantastic in with the Italians and in particular with the Italian embassy in France and so she went to the Italian embassy on Jacquette's first mission and uh, she seduced possibly physically certainly psychologically the uh, uh, the defense attache at the Italian embassy and she, the first Jacques Abte knew that she had something to tell him was when he got a phone call from her saying, we must meet, we must meet, sounding very, very excited. And they met in her Delage uh, luxury motor car, upholstered in snakeskin in central <laughs> Paris. And she drove him through the streets. And he was far more scared of her driving than he was of the snakeskin because she was so excited that she was driving very erratically to such an extent they got arrested by a Paris traffic cop. And it was only when he pulled them over, expecting a drunk driver, and found it was Josephine, she treated to him to that trademark smile that he let her off, and they continued on their journey. She told Jacques Tabte, Acte exactly what she'd found, which was, of course, she found out that not only was uh, uh, Mussolini going to join forces with Nazi Germany, but that that deal had already been done. It had been inked. They already had a contract in place to, to combine forces as the Axis. So that was an incredible achievement, but at the same time, Abte was thinking, you know, spycraft is a subtle, many faceted thing, and it takes an awful long time to learn. There's a lot to learn. Will I be able to control and hone and shape this new special agent in the way that I need to, uh, because she is so, so flighty and so excitable and so self-possessed? And that was his great concern. So to then move on, a little more than a year, possibly 18 months. And this is the great thing about Josephine's story. Let's say 18 months from that moment, Josephine has become the, the, the spy master. She's turned the tables on him. She has become the, the, the teacher. He's become the pupil almost. And it comes about partly because she has she is so naturally suited to this role. But also it comes about simply because Jacques Abte can't travel anywhere. He is not a globally um, you know, recognized and acclaimed performer. Josephine still has a reason to go to Lisbon. 
to perform in a neutral territory or Madrid to perform in a neutral territory, even back into Vichy France, because she is that entertainer and she puts on these bona fide shows and they take her to these places with her voluminous tour luggage and every time she can go there under that cover to carry out her espionage work. Jacques Tab Abte can't travel. He is actually at that stage for many months marooned um, in their base, which by that time was in Casablanca in, in Morocco. And so she takes over the role that he initially was, was worried about teaching her. And it's an exceptional thing about her, her wartime story is that not only does she kind of like take hold of this craft with both hands and hone it and make it her own, but at many times in the war, all those who she's serving alongside, most of whom are men, most of whom are either French, British or American, as she increasingly serves as a spy for the British and the Americans. But at some time, nearly all of them kind of lose heart. And you can understand why, because, you know, up until, I don't know, mid-43, you could argue that the war was going better for the, for, for the Axis powers than it was for, for the Allies. And, and many people, there were many dark hours when these colleagues of her, these long-standing agents, thought the war was lost or feared the war was lost. Josephine never did, or at least she never publicly admitted it. And whenever those colleagues of her said, you know, well, I'm losing heart or something of that nature, Josephine was the one to shore them up. And she would always say, actually, this was her line. Don't fear. There's nothing to worry about. And I'm paraphrasing because America will answer the war and you don't will enter the war and you don't know what Americans are capable of. You've never seen Americans in action. And when America enters the war, we will win. So uh, I just, you know, you, you touched on this briefly, but again, just because it's just so amazing to me, she's got no training, right? She, she just becomes an agent. There's no, you know, take this young woman, teach her this craft. She just dives right in. Dives right in. Absolutely. I mean, the most, the most telling example of that and probably the most, it, it's not the most, um, it's, probably, it's not the most dangerous. Yeah. It's hard to say which is the most. She risked her life so many... And sorry, incidentally, she didn't just risk her life. I mean, this is a really important point. You know, two just prior to the outbreak of the war, or it could have been during the phony war, I can't quite remember, but it doesn't matter. Two German uh, high society ladies were caught spying for Poland in Germany. They were beheaded. Yeah. And the Gestapo had decided that in their wisdom, you you wouldn't behead people with a guillotine the way you used... That, that tradition you do, which is with them facing downwards, you would face upwards and see the guillotine coming down or the axe coming down. So if Josephine had been captured and unmasked, she would not just have faced death. She would have faced awful, awful, awful things mm. in an effort to make her talk and reveal her network amongst many, you know, many other things. And so that the, the, the mission that I guess stands out in my mind because it, um, well, it, it was it was of such war changing consequence was that first major mission that they undertake in the summer of 1940. So, and it's fascinating that, you know, just days after Dunkirk and defeat in, 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 in Europe, Churchill gathers his spy chiefs and he says to them, look, where is France? France has gone dark. We have not a single agent or source or radio um, station left, left operating we can't defend this island and we certainly can't go on the, the going on the counterattack without intelligence from france get me back into france and so josephine's so paris has fallen and josephine's traveled to her country retreat which is a chateau chateau des milondes in the dodon and she's there with this kind of like makeshift resistance crew but no one knows how to resist no one knows what to do and then jacques Abte turns up and he has her mission handed down to him from Paul Pellol, the head, the, the head of the Deuxième Bureau, which of course no longer exists because France has signed an armistice with Nazi Germany. So all the spying that's now going on by those right-minded Frenchmen is secret spying. It's secret, secret spying. It's not just I mean, spying secret by its very nature. This is secret, secret spying because you're spying illegally against the the, the, the you know the, the the power that your government signed an armistice with so all of that intelligence that Ab, uh, Abte, Pelol and all their colleagues secretly gathered over the summer of 1940 crucial to Britain Ab, the only dog in the fight at that time 
absolutely crucial. I mean, we're talking all the Luftwaffe air bases from where they're flying the Battle of Britain missions. We're talking the list of the German agents dropped into Britain. We're talking plans to invade Britain by the back door via Ireland and via Wales and Scotland. Um, it, it, plans to take take Gibraltar. Just reams and reams of, of, of intelligence. All of that material Abte brings to Josephine's Chateau in the Dordogne and says, we have to get this to Lisbon because in Lisbon, the capital of neutral Portugal, at the British Embassy, there is a secret intelligence service cell and we will get it into their hands and they will, from there they can spirit it to London. There are regular flights from, from Lisbon to London. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to hide it all in your tour luggage and you are going to organise a tour to Lisbon. You're going to put on shows. It's going to be a bona fide tour. That's our cover. And in your tour luggage, we will hide all this intelligence. And I use the word hide advisedly because some of it would be transcribed in invisible ink um, on her score sheets, the, her musical score sheets, and Abte was a was was a, a master at that that spy craft. But some of it, so the photographs, for example, of the landing craft that um, the Germans were planning to use to invade Britain, uh, other raw intelligence had to be carried as raw intelligence. So the point being, if they opened Josephine's tour trunks on that journey from of France from the Dordogne to Lisbon and there were many checkpoints on the way uh, she would be finished and, and Josephine embraces that mission with open arms and indeed over and above that she says to Jacques Abte who now is his false name is that he's Jacques Herbert Herbet, a uh, former ballet dance dancing instructor from um, Marseille uh, she says to him your name uh, Jacques Herbet will be stamped in my passport with accompanying Josephine Baker as her, as her tour manager. So you have extra cover, which means if, which would have meant had Abte been arrested, because of course he was far more known to the Germans, then Josephine would have been as well. So she, she triples the risk to herself. And they set off on by train. So they go from, from France uh, to the, through the Pyrenees across the Spanish border. And that's their first major border crossing. There's Spanish customs agents, French customs agents, there are Gestapo agents, there are SS breezing along the platform. And the amazing point about it is, because I was wondering, well, you know, how on earth do you get through? The most amazing point about it is that Josephine, you know, I described her in her gardening clothes at a chateau. She gets off that train at that checkpoint from, from France into Spain, dripping in furs, furs and jewellery looking a million dollars and everybody who sees her goes my god it's josephine it's josephine baker and so all those agents who should have searched her and stopped and asked her for papers and searched her luggage instead they run and fetch their wives and their girlfriends and their children to get a photograph with josephine baker the super spa and she breezes along the platform no one searches her luggage no one searches herself a person jacques abte is the gray figure who's forgotten kind of in the glow of her presence and they do that at every single checkpoint along the way, or rather she does that. And it, it's it's remarkable um, to the extent they get to the airport in Madrid and there are all these these air, aircraft lined up uh, on the runway, which are you know German warplanes with swastikas on them, because as we know, the, the Spanish neutrality was rather skin deep. Um, and she does it there at the airport. And they get on the plane, and they fly into Lisbon and they get those 40... 40 files of intelligence in Josephine's tour trunks to the British Embassy. They deliver them to the Secret Intelligence Service. They're flown by BOAC scheduled flight to London. They're delivered to Wilfred Dunderdale, the former Paris spy master, Biffy Dunderdale, this incredible character, the role model for James Bond. They're delivered into his hand. Two days, three days later, he sends a telegram back to the embassy in Lisbon saying, London is delighted by what you have sent us. And then there's this thing in the tail because they both were determined, Jacques Abdel and Josephine Baker were determined to then take a BOAC flight to London themselves to meet with General de Gaulle, the free French leader who was in, in London, of course, whose call to arms had really helped give them the spirit to resist and find the way. And um, Dundertale says, don't come. You know, we need you back in France. We need you back in France, one, because this intelligence is gold, gold dust, and we need, we need much more of the same. But almost as importantly, we need you to kind of firm up, concrete that pipeline, that flow. If you can go back into France and get that pipeline really flowing through Lisbon the way you've done it first time around, we've cracked it. And that will be, you know, the key contribution to winning the war. So that's what she does, right? 
I mean, Beach, the... that, yeah, so there's two of them there. The Jacques Cartier, Josephine Baker. Dunderdale's basically ordered them. Not that he has kind of... Is he there? He's their spy master. They're not working for him formally, but they're volunteers. So, and in fact, they believe they're working for the for, for de Gaulle's um, free French intelligence services. That's a long story I can go into if you want. But Dunderdale kind of tricks them um, uh, largely because they're actually working for the secret intelligence service. Um, but yeah, so so. Perfidious Albion. Perfidious. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> so um, that's why we I'm left. Gonna, okay, but yeah. you got to. <laughs> So Joseph and Jacques Abde are in uh, Lisbon and um, and they're waiting for more detailed orders from Dunderdale. Well, they think it's from de Gaulle, but it's really from Dunderdale. And um, and, and Jacques Abde says, one of us has to go. So Josephine volunteers. So she gets back on. A, and this is what I was driving at when I was saying incrementally, bit by bit, step by step, she becomes the spy master. She leaves Abte in Lisbon to, to, to receive the orders and the money from, from Secret Intelligence Service that to fund their activities she gets on a flight flies back into um france gets on a train goes to marseille links up with colonel paul pelol who's now running this unsecret secret intelligence network across france and tells him we've delivered the goods and this is the pipeline and we have to get it flowing so yeah she does exactly that so uh, i want to remind everybody that we're chatting today um with damian lewis uh, a terrific historian and his book that we're talking about, it's one of many books, is Agent Josephine, uh, and talking about the espionage carried out by Josephine Baker before and during World War II. And we have a question from the uh, audience, so I'd like to bring that in, if that's okay. Uh, and this is from Frank Cook, who said, did the Nazis ever suspect that Josephine was a spy? Or, or, or you know, essentially, did she get away with, with hiding in plain sight? Was there ever a moment when they were closing in on her or closing in on Abte, and which also could have led to problems for her? There were many. So the first was in um, summer 1940. So she's at her chateau in the Dordogne, and she is gathering um, not only weaponry, but um, intelligence documents. And also she's got various former French military um, officers and former intelligence guys there. And actually, the moment this happened, she's got two um, dozen bureau agents who are now the secret, secret French intelligence service who've come to a chateau with a load of fresh intelligence documents from Colonel Paul, Paul Pelol in Marseille. And they're in the library. She's meeting with them. And her maid comes in a panic and says, uh, the enemy are here, you know, basically. And what happened was a... Um, a squadron of troops from the from the Armistice Commission, which was the the body set up by Nazi Germany to police the Armistice, uh, were at, at, were not just at the gates of the chateau, but had surrounded it. And the colonel uh, comes marching into her uh, library. She's told everyone but her to flee and hide. And um, he's extremely arrogant, um, as you can imagine, and says, um, "We know you're hiding weapons here. We're going to search the chateau." there's been a denouncement. So someone in the community had reported her. And she basically says to him, words to the effect, I paraphrase, how dare you? How dare you believe the denouncer and put credit in what they're saying above me? And she's icy. She won't even give him the honor of um, addressing him either as Colonel or by his name. She addresses him in the third person. She's icy and arrogant back, far more so than he can ever be. And he's thrown. He thinks, well, if she's hiding weapons and doing all the things I, you know, that allegedly she's doing, how could she be behaving like this? And and she says, <laughs> she says, uh, because Josephine also had Native American Indian ancestry, and she says, the the only uh, connection I have to the war, and I'm paraphrasing, is I, I know how to do the Cherokee war dance relating to her ancestors, but that's it. And, 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 and eventually, <laughs> the colonel says, he's just absolutely nonplussed. And eventually he says, um, well, can I at least have a cup of coffee? And she says, I would give you a cup of coffee. Were there any coffee left in France? But there is none because the country's collapsed since you were legally invaded. If you go home to Germany and come again in peace as my guest, I will gladly serve you a cup of coffee, but not before then. <laughs> She's just in his face. And eventually he leaves without searching the chateau at all. 
And <laughs> shortly thereafter, she undertakes a mission, the one I described, taking all the intelligence to Lisbon and, um, and gets away. And that's just one example. There are many, many examples where they know and they're after her and she's one step ahead of them. So, Dave, um, now she's like, as you explained so well in the book, she's there really from the beginning, you know, right? She's she's involved in this from the days of, of the phony war and then the German invasion and kind of the really the dark days for France. But once kind of the tide starts to turn, she kind of sticks with it. She's still involved in these sorts of things. Maybe just touch briefly about how she stays involved and what sorts of things she does from an espionage point of view after the British and the Americans, they land in North Africa and, and you know, things you're looking up, I guess you'd say. Yeah, so she, uh, Josephine and Jacques Epte played this incredible role um, during the, the preparation for the torch landings. So the landings in, 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 in North West Africa by um, American and British forces, springboard, of course, for, you know, the invasion of Southern Europe. Um, they gather crucial intelligence for that operation. You know, the beaches, the defences, all the things you need to know. They get the local leaders on side. It's they 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 they're past masters by now. And indeed, the um, the American kind of spy master they had at that stage in 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 Morocco, um, because they were now reporting to the Free French, to the British Secret Intelligence Service, and of course the Americans in Washington. Um, and no, no, no possibility of confusion there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah in fact actually it's 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 really extraordinary going back to what i was talking perfidious albion earlier right yeah. when the torch landings are successful de gaulle relocates of course his headquarters from london to north africa okay then they discover there is this jacques Habte working with josephine baker running some kind of espionage network they know nothing about it <laughs> zero so they investigate Abtay's basically arrested I mean they, you know they they, they 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 are seriously suspicious about what on earth has been going on and of course Abtay they don't go after Josephine because she's too high profile but they go for Abtay big time of course he's saying look you knew about this all along you know in the, in, in the summer of 1940 we volunteered we were in Lisbon you know and of course they know nothing because that's what Dunderdale's done he's played a double game he's and he had his reasons. He had definitely had his reasons. Um, so, so yeah, um, it, it is quite complicated. Um, and, and and they were uh, they were working they were walking this knife edge, and they weren't just walking that knife edge because the French didn't know what they were doing. For example, they were walking that knife edge because and we touched upon this before the show opened in, in just chatting. What I love about their story, Jack and Josephine's story is that they would do whatever it took to defeat the Nazis, to defeat the greatest evil you could argue we faced in many centuries. They would use anything to do so. And so they worked closely with forgers, assassins, uh, spies from other nations, but also with the mafia, with the New York mafia, but uh, and then the, the New York mafia as it manifested itself in North Africa and across the Mediterranean. So they were working with lots of, um, <laughs> Uh, individuals and organizations who in a time of peace you would have never for one moment imagined getting into a partnership with all of that is fine in a time of war you can argue and of course they were doing so very often with no blessing from those on high so as soon as the war's over of course that becomes highly questionable so th they were really making it up as they went along and once the torch landed are successful and, and the American uh, forces are there in, in North Africa, preparing, of course, then to push eastwards across North Africa, that pincer movement with the First Army, the Eighth Army, Rommel's defeated, then the move into Southern Europe. What, as they're preparing for that, they realise that, you know, uh, morale of the troops is very important. And Josephine Baker is this gold mine in terms of morale because, you know, she can perform to the French troops, she can perform to the American troops, she can perform to the British troops because she speaks things in English, of course. She can perform to just about anyone and anyone can relate to her. And so the American generals go to Josephine. She, she does one show in Casablanca, a, a benefit, and they're so blown away by it. They go to her and they say, look, um, and they've got a contract to uh, uh, retain her services exclusively for, for the American forces as an entertainer for the rest of the war. And she refuses to sign it. It's a highly lucrative contract, by the way. And she refuses to sign it. And she refuses to sign it because she says, look, 
I will always perform for American troops, of course I will, but I've got to be free to perform for, for whoever is fighting the Nazis. And if they're Polish and Czechs or German Jews or Brits or Free French, whoever they might be, I will perform for them. So I'll do it and I'll do it and, and I'm never going to get paid. She was never paid for any of her espionage work throughout the war. She insisted upon that. So she's used in that capacity as a, as a, as a freelance entertainer by all um all the Allied forces through North Africa and then all the way through the invasion of um, Southern Europe and right the way through into Germany itself, you know, in the snows of the winter of 44, 45, you know, um, you know, under fire, un under, under shell fire and attack by warplanes. Uh, and, and at the same time, she never really shrugs off that intelligence cloak. So in North Africa, all of that time she's there, she's gathering intelligence and feeding it back into the system to help with the Allied war effort. Well, you know, I want you to pick up on that because aside from her direct espionage role, some of the descriptions of her tours for entertaining the troops, there are some pretty extreme examples of her commitment to the cause. I mean, she's, this is not a big production. I mean, she, you talk about uh, one particular trip where they go across the desert in a series of Jeeps. Um, conditions that are just horrific. So if you could maybe kind of touch about upon that. And also one of the things that I found really interesting was she had uh, some other rules about entertaining, about who she would entertain for and kind of the, how the crowds were made up. And I think we should probably talk about that too. Yeah, so when, when American troops landed in North Africa, of course, what struck Josephine, but struck Jack Abte and many others um, who were not American um, very powerfully was that American troops were segregated. You had black units and white units and they were like well you know what's going on i mean you know land of the free and here we have um you know segregation on the basis of race of you know people who want to fight and they all want to f they all want to fight you know and what's what's this about and they were shocked and and josephine said to um that first show she did you know in casablanca in um in in, in north africa she said i will perform to the troops but they will not be segregated when I'm singing to them. So she had her shows desegregated and it, it was not popular. You know, it, it caused a lot of uh, ructions with with some in American high command. But, you know, uh, no one was going to gain, say, Josephine Baker because she was this incredible asset. And she said to the troops, she said, look, we do have to fight the battle for um, equality and civil rights. Of course we do. She said, but there's a much greater evil to fight right now. And it's Nazism. We've just got to be pragmatic about this. We have to defeat this threat first, Nazi Germany. And then once that's done, we can come back to the battle for civil rights. And believe you me, I will be with you all the way. So she even brought the troops on the side of her own kind of DIY, you know, makesh makeshift philosophy. And that was the case in all those shows she performed across uh, North Africa and, and all across Europe. She, audiences were not segregated. She never charged for the shows. and. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, so, so, there's that there's that one time they steal the jeeps from yeah. the Americans. <laughs> it's in I can't I think it, I can't is it Algiers? I can't remember. Yeah. And and the 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 vehicles they're driving are so decrepit because they beg, borrowed, and stolen them. Because jo Josephine's funding all of this from the the fortune she had built up before the war because she wouldn't accept any money to do this stuff. So they 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 reach I think it's Algiers and uh, their vehicles fall apart. In fact, they fall apart on the way and they end up hitchhiking yeah. across the desert. I mean, it's crazy stuff anyway. And so they, 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 they steal the Jeeps from the Americans for the next part of their journey. And they kind of drive them out of the city in, in, in the depths of the, of the dark hours to hide from the military police. And they just repainted them in free French colors. It, you know, it, it, it's really out there stuff. And they are, yeah, there are countless times on those, on those tours where both in the North African desert and in um you know and, and and in the war as it became ever more bloody and horrific in 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 northwest europe where josephine was you know risking her life and was under fire and you know um could have very very easily um ended up dying of course and many people said look she started doing this before the war she ended doing it after the war because she was there right after the liberation and uh, uh, and, and then into Germany and then into the concentration camps afterwards, you know, and she, she ruined her health doing this. Why did she not just after two years or three years say, I've done enough, yeah. uh, get me back to the States. 
she was absolutely diehard committed, unyielding in that determination to fight. I mean, she's... In fact, when she was performing to the troops, it was somewhere in northwest France. And it's the push into Germany. And it's it's bitterly cold. And she's performing in a ball gown on the stage. And one of the, you know, one of the, one of the her, her, her tour managers says, look, you've got to go inside. You've got to shelter, you know. And she says, I am a soldier too. I'm a soldier too. And she expects to be treated just like they were. So... Um... Yeah, it's it's an incredible story. I, I want to ask you a question about writing and, and researching this book and, and writing, um, digging in around about anything secret, an espionage story, this story, other espionage stories is challenging because first of all, the, the records may be very skimpy or there may be a big uh, dog preventing you from getting to where the records are. They're still being kept secret. And spies themselves have been known, I don't want to shock you or anybody in the audience, to make some stuff. I mean, one of the things that makes a good spy is that they're a good fabulist, you know, can spin some tales. So um, in a story like this, how do you try to parse all that to get to the truth and you know is there stuff that you you didn't use because you you weren't it sounded good but you weren't sure it was true is there stuff you used that you're like i mm, I don't know you know where how do you do that yeah it's a great question and it, with this story it was it was uh, yeah i've never come across a story with which it was so challenging so as much of this story is about being a historian it was about being a detective there were so many layers of the truth to unpick. So if I can try and explain what I mean by that. So Josephine herself almost never spoke about her secret war work and certainly never in any depth. So she went to her grave with her secrets. Now, in French intelligence circles, you are supposed to remain silent about anything you've done in terms of espionage work for at least three decades, at least three decades. Sadly, Josephine died less than three decades after the end of the or after the end of her involvement in the war. Um, and and most intelligence agents, as you know, go to their grave never having said anything publicly about what they did. So, for example, Wilfred B Biffy Dunderdale, who was this standout spy, you know, an absolute, I mean, he's this icon amongst British intelligence agents to this day. I can tell you stories which will just blow your mind as to how he's viewed today. He went to his grave never having told publicly anything about what, that's what normally happens. However, there are kind of added layers of secrecy which were written into the accounts that people have told of this story. So Jacques Abte wrote his 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 and Josephine's uh, story of espionage in the war, not long after the war, in fact, in, in a book called, um, oh, sorry, the name escapes me. Um, and, and in that book, he himself deliberately writes in obfuscations because one, it's still to this day sensitive in France among communities. You know, France was occupied. Thank God Britain and America weren't. So France was occupied and brother turned against brother, wife turned against husband, village turned against village. And it's still very, very sensitive. Who was a collaborator? Who was a freedom fighter? Who was on the side of right? Who was on the side of wrong? So for that reason, versions of the truth are told. The second reason that Abte and others in particular with this story layered the truth was because, as I said earlier, a lot of what they did in the war was illegal. It was highly illegal. They were smuggling. They were, it was money laundering. It was, it was cigarette smuggling. It, they were working with mafias and, and, and all of that they felt they had to do, rightly, in my view, during the war, because they had to use whoever it would take to defeat the Nazis. But as soon as the war was ended, that became something that you would not readily want to to, to, to admit to. So I'll give you an example of that. So Jack Abte wrote his book, okay? There's no reference at all to all of that smuggling work in, in, in his account, which was written in 1947. Then, in the late 60s, he sat down with Remy, the, 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 the foremost, Gilbert Renault, the foremost French intelligence, sorry, French resistance hero, you could argue, in the war. He sat down with Remy, and a Remy wrote Jacques Capte and Joseph, Josephine Baker's uh, um, uh, war story. It's just called simply J.A., Jacques Capte's initials. It's based upon the interview with Jacques Capte. And in there, Jacques Capte tells the story of the smuggling rackets 
and how they use them as an intelligence gathering network. It, it, chapter and verse, he gives the it's an amazing story, but he uses a pseudonym. So even then, in 1967, he still didn't feel he could admit himself to being the person who, with Josephine, ran those smuggling rackets and used them as intelligence conduits. And then, you know, you graft onto, um, onto all of that the kind of intensive secrecy that tends to surround the files of intelligence agencies. You would expect, you would fear that nothing official had actually been released and, and, and come out and seen the, the light of day. Well, I couldn't have written the book, or certainly not in the form it's written, without the French government being very, very open um, and releasing a raft of files about 18 months ago, two years ago, um, concerning the actions of some of their intelligence agents during the Second World War. And that included Josephine Baker, Jacques Capté, and Colonel Paul Pellos and various other key characters' files. Those were absolute gold dust. And without those, so many things couldn't have been said. So, for example, without those files, it would have been impossible, really, to have established the Dunderdale connection because mm. it's in there in chapter and verse. But without that, and certainly, you know, from my experience, the uh, British Secret Intelligence Service was not about to release any files because they never do. So we weren't about to get it from that side. So the fact the French government did that, you know, hurrah, you know, well done, French government, you know, hugely... Uh, a, a, a well-spirited of you because those files were absolutely um, essential. I mean, crucial, vital. Um, and then, I don't know, books are journeys. Every book is a journey. You need, it has a beginning, a middle and an end. You start it, something fires you up, you research it, and it takes you on this journey. And in this journey, I had a series of miraculous lucky breaks, which I can't, you know, I can't explain to you how... The serendipity is all I can say. I'll just give you one example. So there's a chap in America, lives in the States. He's a British guy called uh, called Paul Biddle, um, who out of the blue sent me, a, a, it was actually a social media message saying, would you like to see the private family archive of Colonel Wilfred Biffy Dunderdale? Yeah. <laughs> right, now, Colonel Wilfred Biffy Dunderdale was Josephine's spymaster in the war and before the war. He was very closely involved with her. So I was like... Uh, yeah, uh, and, but my main thought was, how do you have them? So somehow Paul Biddle, who's a, who's a very, very, very uh, extensive collector of this kind of material, had got all of Dunderdale's archive, and that included lots and lots of documentation about Dunderdale's time with the Secret Intelligence Service. Uh -huh. So he sent me copies of it all. So from that patchwork you then have to knit together the story and you're absolutely right there are parts of it which i'm sure are true which i couldn't write because the source wasn't bona fide so i'll give you an example there was a german guy in the war it's an amazing character um hans musig and hans musig was a he, he was a hitler youth guy before the war woke up to the fact that the Nazis were not a good idea, um, stole the money from his local Hitler Youth Bank account, eloped to Britain, set himself up in Britain as a banker, got it found out, uh, fled to France. And in France, they arrested him, but they recruited him for the French intelligence services. Trying to cut a long story short, Musig became something of a compatriot to uh, Jacques Abdin Josephine Baker uh, in the early stages of their espionage work in the war. And he was this incredible incredible um, operator. Now, Musig is mentioned in one or two of their accounts, but only briefly. Musig writes his own, well, he didn't write it. He got an a, a Austrian journalist called Simmel to write his account of his war. He uses a pseudonym, but it's definitely Musig without a shadow of a doubt. We know that for a fact. And that book, it's called, uh, it can't always be caviar. It was published in German, Musig, uh, uh, Simmel being Austrian. Uh, you can get it in English, but it's very, very rare. But I've read it. And that book is extraordinary. There's lots and lots of material in there about what what Jacques Abde, Josephine Baker and Hans Musi got up to. And it's really, this is really extraordinary stuff. You can't you can't write that because Simel says, I am writing this book. It is a true story, but I can't write it as a true story because the person whose stories it is has asked me to say it isn't a true story. It's one of those catch-22 situations. And I said, no, you can't use that because you just can't. The amazing thing, but yeah, you just can't. 
it's just not verifiable. And also, no, no. what you try and do, you, you guys would appreciate this, you try and make sure there's more than one source. You try and make sure there are three or four or five, and you cross-reference those sources. And where you get a number of individuals from, from, you know, from a degree of separation saying the same thing, you know you're pretty certain about what you're saying. With Musig's account, you just couldn't do that. Well, Damien Lewis, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, to, it's too bad you don't care about the story at all, and <laughs> doesn't seem to know much about it. No, I, uh, okay. Uh, uh, then I'm, I'm practicing my own deception there. Agent Josephine, American beauty, French hero, British spy, or was it French, or was it something else? Anyway, all of the above, uh, and. Uh, uh, a terrific, amazing story, amazing yeah. person, and thank you for working so hard to bring that to life. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. It's been a pleasure. Good. Mr. Anderson, what do we have uh, coming up next week? We have something a little different coming up. A little I think. different. We're going to have tech, you know, really stretch our technical muscles here a bit, and we're going to have, uh, well, uh, four of us, maybe even five, but we're going to have historians. Uh, that will be hosting the Normandy Breakout Masterclass in April for Ambrose Tours. But we're going to have a kind of a panel discussion about the Normandy campaign and the Normandy Breakout and everything that's happening after June 6th. Because I think we have a tendency to think, okay, everybody lands on June 6th. Nothing and happens after June 6th. Nothing happens after that. Until the Battle that, of the Bulge. Right. That's just the beginning. So we want to get um, a bunch of us together to really kind of bring our own little uh, niches about uh, this campaign. Together. And to talk you about the ask, talk about the master class and to have you ask us questions. Um, yeah. Who would the fifth person be? I only listed well, two might, people plus us two. Well, we're hoping to get Hugh who oh. joined us in Normandy to come. Oh you know, you see, he you might know. be still may able to come in the master class. We would love he might that. Be. Yeah, isn't it Hugh part, yeah. Hugh Buchanan McDonald, or is it McDonald no, Buchanan? McDonald Buchanan. I know well there's you know Just string together all those extra names. There's a lot of names there. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate your being here. Join us again next week, or we'll, we're live all month. Uh, so, <laughs> so please be part of it. All right. Be safe, everyone.